name is nihal i am work i work as a marketing specialist at aussies group new south wales uh today we have a session on skill assessment in which our migration agent ali hasan will be talking about acs and engineer australia uh so i would uh, i would like to uh, uh, call ali hasan to to talk about uh, the skill assessment hi hi everyone uh, my name is ali hasan i am registered migration agent at ozis group so i am back again and today the topic of discussion is skills assessment requirements and uh, related occupations uh, i am particularly focusing on engineers australia and acs skills assessment requirements so if you are from uh, engineering background or you are from it background or you are planning to do engineering or it qualification this session will be really helpful for you so let's get started so uh first thing is uh for engineers of australia let me share my screen give me a couple of minutes Okay, so I believe everyone can see my screen now. Sorry, there was some glitch. No, so as I uh, said earlier, I'll be discussing ACS and Engineers Australia Skills Assessment Requirements. I'm a registered migration agent at Aussies Group. So uh, first thing is that uh, what is skills assessment basically? So skills assessment is the first step. uh when if you want to apply for skilled migration uh visas including 189 190 or 491 you need skills assessment and it's also required uh if you are applying for 482 visa under certain occupations and if you are applying for 186 employer sponsored visa under direct entry stream so skills assessment is really important for uh, all these visas and uh, all and if you don't have skills assessment you cannot proceed with uh, those visas uh, the visa sub classes now starting with engineers australia so uh, their requirements and occupations so first uh, these are the few occupations that are assessed by engineers australia now it includes professional occupations such as uh, starting with aeronautical engineering civil engineers structural engineers mechanical electrical materials you know so there is a list a whole list of uh, occupations which are there and those are professional occupations as you can see on the left side now on the right side you also see a uh, few occupations such as engineering uh, professional nec so this uh, why i am particularly i'm highlighting this occupation is because if your occupation does not fall under any other category it is not elsewhere classified you can always go for engineering professional nec now one of the example is for example uh, if you are a textile engineer now that doesn't uh, that occupation does not exist by itself so you can uh, go under engineering professional nec then uh, there is an occupation engineering technologist uh, and then there are few uh, lower level occupations like they are not professional level so for example uh, building and engineering technician civil engineering draft person draft person or electrical engineering draft person etc so in, on my screen you can see all uh, occupations which are assessed by yeah there might be few others but these are the important ones that engineers australia do assess so moving to the main part that 
under which so how to get assessment in any of these fields now uh, there is a uh, this is a diagram which is uh, as per engineers australia now so over here you can see there are certain pathways that are given for different level of qualifications to start with if your qualification so there are mostly two pathways or three pathways here first is if your qualification is accredited by engineers australia by itself or it is accredited by other uh, you know uh, so if, if your qualification you, uh, the, the qualification that you have done uh, was signatory of washington sydney or dublin accord so in those cases a different rule applies to you but if your qualification is not accredited or it's not uh, it, it's it, it, or it is from a non accord listed country then you have a different pathway altogether so i'll discuss both now first if your qualification is accredited by engineers australia and uh, of course uh, you know it is listed as fully accredited uh, according to signatories publish uh, published listing and the date of your qualification matches to uh the listed uh, accreditation dates and you want to be assessed uh according to your degree title and course content then you can go for australian qualification pathway in case you have accredited by engineers australia or if it is accredited by for example uh, uh if it is in under washington accord then you can apply under washington accord pathway same rule applies for sydney accord pathway and dublin accord pathway now for example someone has a qualification which is accredited or which comes under these accords now as you can see uh and and this the third line here so you can only go for if you want to be assessed as per the degree title or course content then you apply under directly under these accord but in some cases if you don't want to be assessed under that particular title now i have had cases where uh, applicants or uh, you know clients they did masters for example masters of mechanical engineering now that can be assessed as for example mechanical engineering because that's the title and that's the course content but if the same person wants to get skills assessment in a different occupation let's say production engineer or industrial engineer they can do that as well but then they cannot go under uh, these pathways like under uh, either uh, under any of these uh, four pathways mentioned below so for such cases they have to go through cdr pathway also uh, which is competency demonstration report pathway now that pathway is also used by someone whose qualification is not accredited or it's not it's from a non accord listed country now again so generally if your qualification is not accredited in uh, you automatically have to go for this pathway now for example someone uh, who has done a bachelor's degree bachelor's of mechanical engineering i'll use the same example and it's not accredited it's not under any of these uh, accords so they'll have to go for cdr pathway now in cdr pathway basically you have to uh, write three career episodes in which you explain in simple words that uh, or, or as per the engineers australia requirements you explain what uh, you basically demonstrate that you are uh, you know uh, you you are an engineer basically okay and you have to write three project uh, you can you have to write three reports now that can be based on your projects that you have done during your qualification or projects that you have completed during internships or projects that you have completed as part of your work experience so you have to write that generally in 1500 to 2500 words explaining uh, what uh, you know uh, what project did you undertake uh what did you achieve what if you have used calculations or diagrams so you have to explain all that in those career episodes and one thing uh all of uh listeners you have to make sure that 
engineers australia is uh, very strict when it comes to plagiarism and generally you know that plagiarism is uh, not accepted in australia in either in academics or in this field so you have to provide plagiarism which means it should be your own work and uh, that's where some people you know generally get stuck it's their own work but they you know they have copied it from somewhere in the past or they have used it so that's something really important when it comes to engineers australia uh, skills assessment now as i mentioned on previous page uh, with occupations there are few occupations like for example civil engineering draft persons now you can also get assessment under that as well through same pathway if you have done a relevant diploma okay now this is all about engineers australia if you have any questions about it you can write in comment section and i will be answering uh those questions at uh the end of this uh, uh at the end of this meeting second is acs skills assessment requirements and occupations that are assessed by acs no acs is australian computing society now there are two types of uh, occupations there so i have divided it in medium uh, there are few occupations that are at a medium long term uh, list and there are few occupations which are on short term list uh, commonly known as now in medium mlt ssl occupations like analyst programmer developer programmers ict business analyst software engineers system analyst so these are the occupations in the long term list when it comes to short term list there are occupations such as database administrator ict support engineers network administrators software testers system administrators and few other occupations that are mentioned on the right side of screen now so you can uh, have a look into it because these are all the occupations that acs can assess so acs uh, unlike uh, engineers australia so engineers australia has either an accredited pathway or for non accredited one in general uh, in simple words however acs has different pathways when it comes to australian qualification and overseas qualification so i'll go one by one starting with uh, australian uh, uh, qualification which is called post australian study pathway now in this if someone who has completed relevant australian qualification which is equivalent to australian bachelor's or masters they need at least one year of post uh, study work experience in their nominated occupation or a professional year program to get skills assessment now uh, so no, one year experience the most important part is it has to be in nominated occupation so how to know what is your nominated occupation that your uh, that will be determined uh, by the course content or or, or the course uh, structure or what what you have studied what sort of degree have you done now i'll give you an example here for example if someone has done masters of it and they had software in, they have mostly studied software engineering uh, subjects but they haven't covered let's say networking related units and they are working in networking uh, for example as a network engineer now they will they cannot get their skills assessed to work experience or their employment uh, might not be assessed the reason is because they do not have experience in nominated occupation and nominated occupation in their case will mostly be software engineer developer programmer or etc okay so the other way is of course if you do professional year now there is one common question uh, generally i have i have got that question many times that can you work while you are doing professional year and will it be counted towards uh, claiming points answer is yes while you are doing professional year and after completion of your study you can do both at same time and you can still claim points for professional year as well as your a uh, work experience if it is in nominated occupation and it's minimum 20 hours per week okay so uh, that's these are the requirements for australian qualification 
Now, if we look for uh, overseas uh, IT qualifications, so uh, there is a division between these two. So someone who has a high bachelor's or higher degree in ICT and they had ICT, so it's ICT major degree and the qualification is closely related to nominated occupation. They need at least two years of relevant work experience in past 10 years or four years anytime in past work history. Other requirement is someone who has a big uh, bachelor or higher degree with ICT major, but their qualification is not closely related to nominated occupation. They will need four years of relevant experience anytime in past work history. Now, the difference in these two is again, the type of work experience that you have done. Again, I'll come back to same point. So if someone has done uh, completed their units related to software engineering and the work experience that they have done was related to software or engineering developer program or related occupation, they will only need two years experience. If same person works as network engineer, but he hasn't studied networking engineering related units in his or her bachelor's, he or she will need four years of work experience. So I hope that part is clear to you. Then uh, coming towards ICT minor qualifications. Okay. Now ICT major and minor, just to point that out. So uh, ACS has definition for ICT major or minor, depending on uh, how many years of qualification you have done. So you can always uh, check with us because if it is three years, definition is different. If it is two years degree, then definition is different. And if it is four years degree, definition is different. So, but for if it is ICT minor degree and qualification is closely related to nominated occupation, then five years of relevant experience is required in last 10 years. If it is an ICT minor bachelor's or higher degree, and qualification is not closely related to nominated occupation, six years relevant experience is required. So applicants who uh, are relying on overseas IT qualification only need more experience as compared to someone who has done an Australian qualification. Then uh, diploma. So there are applicants who have completed relevant diplomas. Now, irrespective of where you have completed diploma from or advanced diploma or associate degree from, if your qualification is closely related, you need five years experience. If it is not closely related, you need six years of work experience. Then coming towards uh, applicants who do not have a relevant qualification or don't have any qualification at all. Now, if someone has a diploma or higher degree and it is not in ICT, for example, they have diploma of uh, business, for example, yeah, they need six years of relevant experience in any, any time in the past. Plus, they will have to write RPL application, recognition of prior learning. So they have to write projects. They have to demonstrate their, uh, again, competency here by uh, ACS has provided a template and they have provided a, a way where you say basically you use the projects you have done and you explain how you are competent in that particular occupation that you are applying for. If you do not have any qualification, then eight years relevant experience is required in past work history plus an RPL uh, application. Okay. So this is so if someone has diploma, unfortunately, they need more experience to get skills assessment. So these are all the requirements for uh, these are all the requirements for ACS and Engineers Australia. And I would also like to uh, bring this to your attention that uh, our OSIS group is having migration and education conclave. Uh, in 2022, uh, which will be starting from, which will run from 4th to 8th of July. And you can scan the barcode that you can see uh, on screen right now. In, in that conclave, basically, you will hear from 
uh, more than 30 plus registered migration agents like me. And you will also uh, see many education experts who will be covering different topics uh, for all during all that time. So I will highly recommend you to join that. Registration is free. You can just scan this code and uh, we'll be, we are looking forward to see you after uh, on, on 4th uh, of July and onwards. Now, I'll go to questions, but here are details. If you need to reach out to us, you can email us, you can call us. We'll be happy to help you further. And now I will take questions that are asked on social media platforms. So I have uh, one question related to bachelor's in chemical engineering. So if someone has done bachelor's of chemical engineering, they can do skills assessment as a chemical engineer from uh, through Engineers Australia. Now, if your degree is accredited uh, as per uh, you know any of the if it is, it comes under any of the accords, you can directly get skills assessment. And sorry, I forgot to add one thing. Uh, with the qualification, you also need uh, English score, which is IELTS or PT equivalents, six each or more. Or if you have completed two years study in Australia, you are exempt from that. Now, if your degree is not accredited, you'll have to go to CDR pathway, where you'll have to write three projects. Yeah, so there is another question from Hiral. So as per him that he has skills assessment as engineering technologist. Now, uh, he is not sure what sort of job is suitable for him. So uh, look, engineering technologist is a general occupation. So generally engineer, engineer, engineer technologists, they do assist professional engineers in their tasks, okay? so. If you get job in uh, if, if you get job in any uh, engineering field where you are assisting senior engineers while you make sure you are meeting other requirements, that should be fine. Engineering technologist is will be used to lodge expression of interest, or that will be your nominated occupation. So I have got uh, one question uh, how, from Karthik, uh, how about the energy sector in Australia? So uh, Karthik, your question is not that clear, but uh, for example, if you are from petroleum engineering background or you are from electrical engineering background, because uh, then you can, uh, of course, apply for skills assessment as electrical engineer, petroleum engineer, minor engineer, there are all these occupations available uh, which are assessed by Engineers Australia. So if you get assessment in those occupations, then you can apply for skilled visa under those occupations. So in the energy sector, uh, unlike, uh, you know, like every other country, it's, uh, you know, as you know that every country is moving towards renewable sector. So need of solar energy or so electrical engineer has increased overall, but of course, migration prospects uh, can vary from time to time and you can always reach out to us to discuss your options through that.
Yep. So I have got uh, another question uh, that uh, so uh, Arjun has asked that his brother has done diploma in production engineering. Can he apply for skills assessment? So uh, look, there are uh, certain occupations where we can definitely look in, but he cannot go for occupations such as production engineer because his he has not done a bachelor's degree. If someone has done a bachelor's degree, then they can go for production engineer. Okay. Now, if he has 18 years of experience, then we also have to check which particular field he has experience in and what level uh, of diploma he has done. If it is equal to associate degree, for example, then we can look for engineering technologist occupation as well, or then we'll have to, there is, for example, mechanical engineering draft person occupation, which is in the list. So, but he, unfortunately, if his degree is not uh, equal to bachelor's or higher, he will not be able to get skills assessment as mechanical or production engineer. So I've got one question from Shakil. Uh, he has asked that he has done bachelor's of network technology in Australia, and uh, he wants to know that if he can get skills assessment as network and system engineer from ACS. So Shakil, certainly yes, you can get skills assessment, but you'll have to go from one of the pathways that I have discussed. Now, if you have completed an Australian qualification which is equal, so since you have done a bachelor's, you can get skills assessment as computer, network, and system engineer if you have covered related units. And by the name of your degree, I can see that, yes, you might have covered those units, but it all depends on content of your qualification as well. In addition to your degree, you either need one year work experience, post-qualification work experience, or you need professional year program. If you have done one of these, then yes, you can get your skills assessment. There is another question uh, related to mechatronics uh, engineering graduate. So uh, look, so first thing is you can check if your degree is accredited under, it, it comes, it's fall, it falls under any of those accords, number one or if it is accredited through Engineers Australia. If not, then you'll have to go through CDR pathway. Now in CDR pathway, depending on units that you have done, so you can go for engineer, uh, engineering professional NEC, or you can, uh, depending on the projects or the content again, you can go towards mechanical engineering or even electronics engineering because in mechatronics, you cover both of those areas. So. That will be my suggestion uh, for you, Kavishka. So uh, Makara has asked that, uh, uh, like they have done business masters of business in ERP systems and have two years experience uh, as HRIS analyst outside Australia after complete after completion of masters. Can they apply for skills assessment? Yes, uh, if your experience again. Now title is you know does does not tell everything. So it, at the end of the day, it depends what duties have you. Performed. Yes, if your duties are matching to, for example, ICT business analyst and your degree was ICT major, then yes, you can apply for skills assessment. So Azhar, uh, you have, uh, Azhar has asked a question uh, related to teaching. Now, uh, I can answer that question, but today the topic of, you know, discussion is ACS and Engineers Australia, but I'll quickly answer that since you have asked the question. So look for teachers. Uh, 
it depends. So there are two levels. Either you are university lecturer or you are going as secondary school teacher or primary school teacher or early childhood school teacher. Now, for every case, the requirement is different. Okay. Now, someone who has done BSc, B8, and has, they can go through AITSL. Basically, that's the assessing uh, body for uh, teaching uh, qualification. Now, one of the requirement is I'm not. I'm saying one of the requirement is that you should have 45 days of supervised teaching as part of your study. Now. If your wife has covered, has done that, and she can get IELTS 7788 score, IELTS academics, she can apply for skills assessment uh, in, in, as a teacher, depending on how many years of study she has done. So I believe she would have done at least four years of study in total. But it's not, I, I'm not going into further details about it. Uh, either we wait for another session related to teaching or you can reach out to us and we'll be happy to discuss but just to uh, give you summary of it uh, you have to check if you can get english score and if he has done 45 days of supervised teaching in her b8 so jibran has asked <coughs> that uh, he has done yeah so that's uh, you know generally that's very common that uh, you know and he has done bachelors uh, in engineering electronics engineering and masters in it and he wants to know which uh, degree should he go for now in such cases my recommendation is to get both qualifications assessed especially, uh, but it also depends on case to case, but it's always better to have multiple assessments. Now, in that case, you can uh, be in the queue with, uh, for, uh, or you can lodge UI under both of these occupations. So if you have two different qualifications, I would definitely not suggest you to only focus on engineering. You can get skills assessment in engineering as electronics engineer, or maybe engineering technologist, depending on your uh, uh, projects uh, <clears throat> and at the same time focus on IT qualification as well. If you have studied in Australia, of course, complete PY, get work experience. Okay, and if you have already done that and you have assessment in both occupations right now, then it depends uh, which state are you in. Okay, and so some generally in few states or few regions, IT is in more demand or in few states or region engineering can be in more demand so that's why you have to you should have both occupations so you can uh, then decide which one to go with when you are lodging 491 uh, nom uh, nomination or eoi so mirza uh, you have I've answered same question. So again, I will recommend you to, of course, continue your professional year, get your skills assessment through ACS, of course. And at the same time, you can write CDR if your degree is not accredited. And you can also get skills assessment as an engineer. Now, it does not harm you or you will still have, uh, you know, you will still have both uh, occupations. Okay. So, I always suggest or recommend uh, my clients or all the applicants to have multiple assessments and it, it, you don't you never know what uh, in future if one occupation can be in higher demand as compared to others. But if you have assessment, it's always beneficial for you. So Sirinivas has asked a question that uh, he is working. So he did his skills assessment as system admin 
in 2018. And since then, uh, he has been working in DevOps role. And now he wants to do his assessment again, of course, because that previous assessment has expired. Now, look, in, in these cases, uh, Srinivas, uh, it's answer is not that straightforward because we have to check the duties before I can recommend you for any possible code. Okay. So title by itself does not mean that you are working in that particular occupation. So at the end of the day, it, it, is, it, it is your duties which will define which code can you go into. Okay. Now, at the same time, we also have to look the how many years experience you have in total. So, for example, if you go for a new code, you will not get all experience assessed in that new code. Okay. And uh, if you go for existing code, you might get all your experience assessed and you might be able to claim more points. So, that's why it's definitely recommended for you to have a consultation so we can assess your eligibility and we can see under which code uh, you will fall and which is better code giving your uh, circumstances. But generally, if you are in NSW uh, or generally speaking, analyst programmer uh, is, is better because it's in long-term list, uh, basically. System admin is in short-term list, but of course, you still have options through system admins as well. Okay, so just looking for another question. So, uh, there is one question related to, you know, NSW 190. Yep. So I'm not discussing visas today, but uh, for example, and uh, if someone has, you know, let's say five years experience from overseas and they have a relevant bachelor's degree, ICT major, they can get skills assessment using that degree. So two years will be used to give them skills assessment and then they they can still get points for remaining three years. And those three years, they can use uh, to maintain eligibility for 190. So there is a common confusion uh, among different applicants that if you, you, that three years experience has to be in Australia or overseas. So it can be in Australia or it can be overseas. So if you have any experience overseas and you have a relevant qualification, I will uh, also recommend you to get your assessment through overseas uh, or skills pathway through ACS so that you can uh, claim maximum points and you can uh, get get become eligible for 190 in NSW. Okay, so I believe I have answered all the questions. If you have any more questions, uh, you can reach out to us uh, on this email. And uh, Mirza has asked uh, my email address. Uh, Mirza, we can, uh, I'll ask my team to send it to you or you can email uh, on the email address that you can see on the screen and uh, they will forward your email to me. So thank you uh, everyone for joining me today. Uh, it was, um, uh, I believe this uh, session was helpful. And if you have any confusion or doubt, or you want our assistance, you can always reach out to us. And uh, we will also wait to see you for our migration and our education conclave starting from 4th of July, uh, basically, which is next month in a few weeks. That's where you will get a lot of information about all these visas, assessments about migration, education, and all those. So you can register yourself and we'll uh, see you there.
thank you all uh, once again for joining and have a good evening and have a great weekend.